الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد. So inshallah today we will continue to talk about uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Since we have not covered everything, we intend to mention about him. There is so much to be said about Imam Ahmed. His, uh, his life, his contributions are probably one of the most documented. Being the latest of the four Imams in terms of time, his students have documented a lot of his heritage and a lot of his news. So, and obviously as you go, you know, later in time, uh, there was more documentation about everything, about everything. So, uh, so that was an advantage for Imam Ahmed. So you have a lot of details about his life. Uh, there's something I thought of starting with, since we are studying the lives of these great Imams, we should not take it as entertainment. In the sense, we should not just see this, oh, okay, that's a beautiful story, a beautiful life, wonderful person, made some great contributions, let's enjoy the story, go back home feeling good about ourselves. I mean, that's a good thing, but to a certain extent. The, you know, the title for this series, we said, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ The ayah, the verse. Indeed, in their stories, there are lessons for us to benefit from, to learn. And that's the main point behind this series. So the reason we are talking about these stories and about these personalities is there is a lot for us to learn. Because their times, in their times, they faced trials, challenges that were not present at the time of the Prophet or the time of the companions, or even the time of a tabi'een. So Imam Ahmad at his time, there was a different challenge. There was a different challenge, or a different number of challenges. So you would, we should notice that these Imams have actually developed some tools in order to be to handle their current challenges. They developed sciences, they developed insights, they developed strength and knowledge that enabled them to charge head on those new ideas, philosophies, misconceptions, doubts, challenges that were facing the Muslims. So there was a lot of challenge, intellectual challenge, challenges at the time. During the Khilaf al Abbasiyya or the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, a lot of translations were taking place. So, the Greek philosophy, a lot of the books were translated. And that's how uh, the, like, uh, the books of the Greek philosophers are still uh, present today. They were lost in their original language. In the European languages, these books, most of these books, were actually lost. They were preserved by Muslims. And a lot of the books that you have today from Greek philosophers were translated back from Arabic into European languages. So they were preserved to a great extent in the Arabic language by Arab translators. This was thought to be a very active intellectual life, but it took a toll on the purity and the pristine nature of Islam itself. Because some of those who studied this philosophy and those contributions, they wanted to use them to understand Islam. So they took them as their springboard, as the frame through which they wanted to see and study Islam. And that led to a lot of problems, a lot of issues, specifically with Aqeedah. So this is why the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the fitna of Khalq al-Qur'an, the statement that the Qur'an was a creation and was not merely the words of Allah, but was a creation. Uh, it reached a climax at that time, at the time of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. It had been there for about a hundred years. It started around, uh, during the life of Abu Hanifa, by the way, this issue came up. And it was merely an intellectual uh, form of luxury. Some philosophers were thinking about this, presenting this, and they talked a lot about Al-Qadim wal muhdath about what is eternal and what is created, what came into existence and what was timeless and what was bound by time and so on and so forth. So they tried to understand Allah and they tried to understand the words of Allah, the Quran, through this kind of philosophical uh, parameter. So this, they applied these laws of uh, philosophy, trying to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His words. So that's why the confusion came about. So at the time of Abu Hanifa, for example, there was a big issue whether Quran was a creation or not. And uh, some confusion happened with regards to Imam Abu Hanifa as well. So he was accused of saying, or of agreeing with the statement 
But actually, with scrutiny, you'd see that Imam Abu Hanifa himself did not agree with it. Did not agree with it, but he had a certain distinction. He made some kind of nuances in that understanding. Anyway, so hundred, uh, around a hundred years, a century later, during the time of Imam Ahmad, the later part of his life, this became a very big issue because the Muslim Khalifa, al Ma'moon, took this like to heart. He took this aqidah. He was mainly educated by Mu'tazila, by people from, come from the Mu'tazili, who are extremely based, their principles are extremely based in, on philosophy. They call themselves Aqlaniyun, people of the intellect, extreme intellect and logic. But actually, the scholars of Islam have shown the contradictions that they have within their own system. But anyway, so they, they have taken enough power with the, with the Khilafah and they themselves were the educators of Al Ma'mun and they won him over. So he believed in this Aqeedah, which is that the Quran was a creation. And uh, he actually made some kind of a degree, uh, dec so some kind of a decree, some kind of a stipulation that everyone should be tested. So he sent to the police department in Baghdad, for example, to check with, to test each Imam, each of the teachers. What do you say about the Quran? Do you agree the Quran is a creation? Do you agree? It, it was so blatant and so obvious. So, so that was the case. Now, going back to the point, you see that these Imams were not, they did not, they were not just people who memorized hadith and remained disconnected from their environment from the challenges of their time. Rather, they developed tools, they were very grounded in Islamic sciences, in Hadith and Quran, and yet they were able to relate to what was happening in their time, and they were able to put everything in perspective. And that's what a lot of us Muslims are failing to do today. We're failing to do this. Why? Because we have a very traditional school of thought that wants to surround itself with walls and wants to protect everything it has and it wants to disconnect from everything else. And this has alienated it and has made it to a great extent uh, irrelevant and it also has led to a great level of naivety in terms of dealing with modern arguments and accusations that are leveled at Islam and Muslims. So the children of the people who grew in this kind of school of thought, when they are exposed to the external world, when they go to school, to university, they hear some doubts, misconceptions, questions, challenges, issues about Islam that they have no clue about and they, ha they are not equipped with any tool to be able to handle it. So it becomes a fitna for a great deal of them and that's why we have today a phenomenon that is common among Muslims questioning their faith. Muslim youth questioning their faith, really doubting whether Allah is there or not, whether Islam is the truth or not doubting the history of Islam, about the Prophet ﷺ, about the warfare in Islam, and about marital issues in Islam, and about a lot of these things. And they have no tools to deal with that. Why? Because we're trying to feel good about ourselves, we want to preserve what we have, which is good, but still we need another thing with that. So, let's stay disconnected from everything else. We're going to just hold on to this, we're going to understand the world through this, we're going to force everyone to agree with this, if they don't, we, 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 we disconnect from them, and that's it. The problem with this, as I said, it made us irrelevant to our times. We're unable to communicate, oftentimes we're unable to communicate the message in a way that people can even relate to it. So we're creating some kind of intellectual island where we live in isolation. And this has led to a lot of misunderstanding on the other side as well. On the other extreme, you have Muslims who are watering Islam down, and they just wanna, they wanna understand Islam through the Western philosophy, the global philosophy today that is dominant in the world. So they wanna judge Islam, they wanna accept from Islam and reject from Islam based on what modern philosophy says. And modern philosophy has its pull and its power because it's a lived reality. You see it in the streets, you see it on TV, you see it on, uh, on the web, on the internet, you see it in school. You see it in universities, you see it wherever you go. And when a philosophy is turned into a way of life, it becomes very powerful and very influential. And when you are immersed in it, when you live in it, you, you, become, you have a disadvantage against it. 
why am I bringing all of these things? Is that we, what we need today is, alhamdulillah, I think the Muslim Ummah has done a very good job in preserving the, the, uh, you know, the pristine message of Islam, the beauty, the original authentic message of Islam. It's been preserved from the time of the companions, the tabi'een, tabi'i, tabi'een, the imams, throughout the ages, have preserved it. But we cannot stay and live captive. We cannot stay captive to, uh, to something that was meant. Like a lot of the arguments that we have in Aqeedah today, that are being taught, that are being taught to general people, general masses. These were designed in response to, for example, the Mu'tazila were designed in response to the Asha'ira, to the Maturidiyya, were designed in response to certain, you know, uh, issues or said, I would say, inaccurate approaches to Aqeedah or wrong approaches to Aqeedah. So these were dominant at the time. So this is why they needed to be addressed. This is why you find, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, they've actually gone into philosophy after being very well established in Islamic sciences. They've gone into philosophy and they are using the same terminology that these people use in order to show the futility and the weakness of their own arguments. You can go as far as this if you have a very strong grounding when it comes to Islamic sciences. But it shows you that the scholars, Muslim scholars at, ev at each time, every time in our ummah, they have been relevant to whatever challenges were at their time. But a lot, it seems that the Muslim Ummah is going through a very down time, hibernation, some kind of hibernation. And we think our job today is just to stay true to what we have and not be able, not develop tools, authentic tools to be able to deal with the challenges we're facing today. So we're falling short there. We're falling short there. And we think that's all what we need to do. But we are paying from our own youth losing their faith. We're paying from our own brothers and sisters questioning some of important clear-cut issues about Islam. Because Muslims, whether you like it or not, have this exposure to this Western philosophy, Western lifestyle. They're exposed to it every day. So this is some kind of brainwashing. This is some kind of even uh, hypnosis. Day in and day out, they are bombarded with these ideas, and they're not merely ideas, they are lived ideas. They're so vivid, so animated, that they are very powerful. They are images, they are lifestyle, they are characters, they are symbols. It's such a powerful flood that is overwhelming, and it's hard for one person to fight it, or even stand in, in that powerful current. So what is the solution? The solution is for us to rise up to the challenge as Muslims, and see, embrace the heritage, the pure heritage that we have inherited and believe in it, study it and understand it and also study our times. Study our times. What are the challenges? What are the philosophical challenges that are presented in Islam? What are the historical challenges that are presented in Islam? What are the political challenges? What are the intellectual challenges? What are the scientific challenges that are presented to Islam and Muslims that are causing some Muslims to doubt Iman, doubt faith? And that are putting some, a lot of Muslims in very awkward positions. Sometimes when they are asked questions, they can't answer them. I mention examples that I come face to face with on a daily basis. So I hope maybe some of the brothers are here. I hope they don't get offended. A few times in my halaqas, in my classes, I do mention things that I've witnessed with my own eyes, I heard with my own ears, or I've come across, I've experienced firsthand. Sometimes people we feel offended. I don't mention names, but I'm mentioning cases. And the reason is we want to deal with reality. I mean, we can talk, I mean, we can talk nice all day, but that's not going to help us. We need to call a spade a spade. We need to look at the challenges we're going through. Because if we do not wake up to the challenges, if we keep putting our heads in the sand and feeling good about ourselves, yeah, you come to the masjid, you see Muslims, you experience, okay, people praying, Muslims, uh, women are covered, children know Allah, you hear words of the Quran, fine, alhamdulillah, but who knows that 10 years from now, the situation will be the same. Who knows? Because looking at the masajid, the number of the youth that are coming to the masajid is less than it used to be. 10 years ago, and even five years ago. There's less number of youth coming to the masajid than there used to be. The classes and the halaqas for knowledge used to be more full. And that's a, that's a, a common phenomenon in the Muslim congregation, Muslim uh, minorities in the West. 
Canada, US, uh, UK, Australia, it's the same thing. Everyone is, Imams are saying the same thing. There are less people coming to classes, less people want to learn more about Islam among the Muslims. And there is a challenge to their identity and to their faith. There are people doubting their faith. There are Muslims leaving Islam. There's an issue we have, it's a red flag. And we have to address it. So if we just keep talking nicely and feeling good about ourselves, we don't know what's happening and we will be shocked. And then it would, might be too late for us to do anything to change it. So there, there are expectations that if there is not enough youth coming to the masajid and they're all drawn into different institutions, different orientations and uh, different activities, the huge number of masajid that we are buying, they need a congregation, right? So if there's no congregation, what are, what are these masajid going to do? And these masajid depend on the funding of the community. If there's no community, what are these masajid going to do? Is it going to end up where Muslims are going to start selling masajid like churches are being sold? Because there's no congregation? These are serious issues we need to consider. Don't feel good about, okay, you have 10 friends that are practicing, alhamdulillah. Look at the bigger reality. Look at the bigger reality. How many Muslims are not coming to the masjid? Don't pray even Jum'ah. How many? How many are people are compromising on their deen? And it's not only the misconceptions, now there's more pressure. There's more pressure. You used to walk in Toronto with your thawb, a woman walking with her hijab, no issues in Toronto. But now walk around and you see the weird looks at you. Everywhere you go, you don't feel comfortable. You get on the subway, you got on the bus, you see weird looks. Why are you dressed up like this? People are, are saying it with their eyes. They don't have probably the audacity to verbalize it and attack you. But people are saying it with their eyes. What's this? Why are you so different? And the whole thing that's in the media goes through their minds. So things are changing. Things are changing. And if we do not rise up to the challenge, we will regret it. We will regret it. We have to... So these Imams, as, as you see, we mentioned for example, <coughs> With Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, the, <coughs> the knowledge was less systematic. So there were Imams teaching and people were going to so many teachers here and there and they were learning from this and that. But Imam Abu Hanifa, he developed a very profound understanding and structure around his own knowledge that it became a school of thought. That a lot of his students sufficed themselves with Imam Abu Hanifa. That his knowledge was enough, his system was enough for them to have a complete system of relating to Sharia and understanding the words of Allah and the words of the Prophet and that gave him the power and the influence. The Imam Malik, his focus on hadith and his understanding of hadith and his uh, meticulous attention to details when it comes to the Sunnah of the Prophet and Amal Ahl al Madina, you know, what the companions were upon in Medina and documenting this and showing this through his, embodying this through his character was such a profound influence on people that he became a great Imam. He became a school of thought. Imam Shafi'i, he noticed the, the divide between Ahl al-Ray, Ahl al-Hadith. Two divergent schools of thought. These are focused so much on understanding things and building men mental structures. The other one is so literalist and focused on the words of the Hadith, sometimes to the negligence of the wisdoms and the meanings behind them. So Imam Shafi'i realized these are going to an extreme, these are going to an extreme. But the truth is somewhere in the middle. We need both. You have truth with you, you have truth with you. And it, these two truths do not have to be divergent. They can be together, they can exist together. And that's actually the perfect formula. And that's what Imam Shafi'i did. So he came up with these sciences like Usul al-Fiqh. And even Usul al-Hadith. Imam Shafi'i is considered to be the founder of Usul al-Fiqh and Usul al-Hadith, Mustalah al-Hadith. His book al-Risala is a book on both. He's considered to be the founder of both. So the scholars of Hadith consider the first book ever to be written on Usul al-Hadith or the Mustalah of Hadith is al-Risala by Imam Shafi'i. The scholars of Usul al-Fiqh, they consider the first book to be written on their, in, on their science, Al-Risala, the same book. So Imam Shafi'i came up with something that solved a lot of problems for people in, order, in, in relating to uh, the book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Prophet and how to relate to it. Imam Ahmad himself, he took that to the next level. When he made it a point to try to collect everything that came from the Prophet ﷺ. Everything, literally everything. So he traveled to so many cities and so many countries and he documented each hadith he, he, he studied. And he went to all the known scholars who had hadith and he took their hadith from them and he documented them. 
He documented them. Everything, all the hadith, with all the narrations, with all the wordings, with all the roots of narration, everything. He documented that and he had it in his memory and in his books. And then he built his fiqh based on this rich textual material. And he, he was very well informed of the opinions of the scholars behind him, uh, before him. So he managed to build a very powerful system of hadith and fiqh that is compatible, that is integral, practical, clear, and systematic. That's the excellence of Imam Ahmed. And yet in Aqidah he had a powerful contribution, and that was a gift, I believe, a gift given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when that predicament or that test of the issue of Khalq al-Quran became very prominent, and almost all the scholars, all the scholars of Ahl sunnah gave in. Why? To protect their souls and themselves, they gave in and they said a false statement. They said that in public. Why? To save their own souls, save their own life. For them, they saw that as a necessity. So some of the uh, historians at that time, they said, So the Imams at the time, the scholars, they gave in. They said, yeah. This is a statement, they believe it's kufr, but they said it. Why? Because they feared for their lives, except for four Imams. Among them is Imam Ahmad. And those four Imams, two of them gave in late, uh, like to, uh, afterwards they just gave in. They couldn't take the torture anymore. Then there was Imam Ahmad and another one. The other one died, Muhammad ibn Nuh died, and Imam Ahmad survived. So it was Imam Ahmad. He maintained that, and he preserved that. And he sacrificed his life for that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved him to, uh, st to stand in, in, in challenge and defiance to this kind of false testimony, false haqeedah, false understanding. That's based on uh, a faulty logic of Al-Mu'tazila, trying to understand the Qur'an like this. So each one of those Imams were relevant. So Imam Ahmad wasn't ignorant. If he were ignorant, he would say, oh, okay, this statement, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. No, but he understood what it meant. You don't find in the Qur'an or the Hadith whether the Qur'an is a creation or not a creation. It's not even mentioned. Because there's no need even to go there. But these Mu'tazila, there was so much into their minds, in their heads, so they actually, what they did, they started to try to analyze everything mathematically in angles and boxes and so on. But that's how not you relate to things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَسْأَلُوا عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ إِنْ تُبْدَ لَكُمْ تَسُؤْكُمْ All you who believe, don't ask about things that when they are revealed to you, they would offend you or they would cause you harm. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith, إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَرِهَ لَكُمْ قِيلَ وَقَالْ وَكَثْرَةَ السُّؤَالِ Allah hates for you so much talk. Chat, talk about everything. What do you mean by this? What's this? What did he say? What did she say? Oh, that he said. What does he mean by that? Oh, there's a word like this. There's a word. Don't be so obsessive with this. وَكَثْرَةَ السُّؤَالِ An excessive asking. Asking, asking about everything. You know, you know there's the, you know, the, the paper notes that we have. They say there is gelatin in it. There is animal fat in it. There is, you know, pork fat in it. Oh, is it haram to use it? Is it haram to... Come on. Don't get there. Don't get there. <laughs> Don't get there. This kind of obsession with all of these details. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ مِنْ أَشَدِّ النَّاسِ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ One of the people that Allah hates the most. إِنَّ مِنْ أَشَدِّ النَّاسِ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ رَجُلٌ سَأَلَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ <coughs> رَجُلٌ سَأَلَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ سَكَتَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ A man or a person who asks about something that Allah did not make any judgment about, whether it's halal or haram, Allah just left it open. سَأَلَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ سَكَتَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ فَحُرِّمَ لِأَجْلِ مَسْأَلَتِهِ So this thing was made haram because he asked about it. This is why the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, how often would they ask the Prophet ﷺ? Hardly, they would hardly ask him questions. They would hardly ask him questions. Someone is going to come to you, this jacket, what leather is this? Is it haram or is it halal? Oh, was the animal slaughtered halal way? Yeah, this like, like people are searching for things, like they want to make things wrong. Like people are searching, it's like the surfer mechanism searching where there's a mistake. Wow, 
That's it, they're going to jump on it and they love it when they find a mistake, when they find something wrong. I've done a great contribution, I've found something wrong. That this attitude is not Islamic at all. It's not Islamic at all. So, what we have now, people are obsessed with all of these small things. So, these small things. I want to go back again to the, 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 why I started this whole kind of, it's some kind of ranting I understand, but I think it's important. Is <clears throat> what I've seen in our community, some people with good initiative, like they had some kind of conversation with some uh, congre Christian congregation, a church congregation, and those guys in the church, they said, why don't you come and tell us about Islam? We're going to give you a platform. Talk to our congregation about Islam. And these brothers in their, I mean, well-meaning hearts, they, they said, well, 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 that's good. Why not? So they go and they present something about Islam, and it's a very good response. And they think, yeah, we're going to do it. Now we're converting these people, right? We're going to get at least one Muslim from there. They do it one time, two times, second time. So it happens a few times. Then, so I was invited. I, I hope no one, if anyone is involved in this, don't get offended. It's just, this is something that is, it's a setup. It's a setup. So we need to be careful. What's going on? So I was uh, one of the brothers with very good intention and mashallah, very active brother. He says, why don't you come and uh, you know, join us one time and you can make a speech and so on and so forth. I said, I'm really busy at the time, but it's just, we'll see later on. Then a few weeks later, the brother says, we're stuck. I said, what? He said, these people have done their homework. I said, what? I said, we're talking about the Prophet and his seerah, and these people have their questions ready. And these are questions we have no answers to. And we're stuck. So we want you to come. I said, I think, Zakallah khair. You need to be careful. You need to be careful. People are watching debates or talks by Zakir Naik, by Ahmad Didat, by Hamza Sources, and you think, oh, I can do this. And you jump in and you get stuck. And what's the problem? You'll start doubting your deen. You will start doubting Islam. Because you're put in a position, you're so involved, you're so dedicated, and they set you up, and are you so passionate about it, and you need to prove as well that you have good intention and that I'm searching for the truth. So if there's evidence, I'm going to follow it, right? Because you're expecting them to have this attitude, so you're going to profess it. Say, if there's evidence, I'm going to take it regardless, right? And now they corner you. Here's a question, answer it for me. What about all these wars? What about concubines? What about men marrying four wives? Why can't a woman marry four men? Where is equality? Where is women's rights? What about this man being killed in this situation? What about this incident in Sahih Bukhari? What about this man marrying this woman? What about this age and that age, right? Okay, you said you want to follow evidence. Go ahead. You're not. And you're stuck now. It's a very difficult situation morally, in terms of faith, intellectually. You're stuck because you've been set up. So a lot of people see these debates by Zakir Naik, Ahmad Didat, Khalid Yaseen. They get excited, right? Oh, can I do this? That's easy. You might do this with someone in the street, you might get by, right? But when people are ready for you, things are, challenge are changing. These people are learning from their mistakes, so they're coming up with new arguments that you, you can't answer. Not because there's no answer, but because you can't answer and because we are living in a context that is mainly built on western philosophy modern western philosophy okay because even western philosophy changes it's not one thing it's different from country to country it's different from time to time from age to age it's different it keeps evolving and developing so this current it, uh, contemporary western culture is the dominant medium where we live so and it has its immorality it has its unethical principles, but because we live in them, we've become desensitized. So these people, when they present you with an argument, they build these arguments on these issues that you are desensitized to. So it doesn't occur to you that even the logic you are using to, ana to analyze and assess the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ or the history of Islam or some aspect in Islam is based on a faulty principle. Because you live in it, you're immersed in it. 
So now it's not you answering a question. Now you have to go back to the underlying principles, to the logic that the assumptions on which this culture and this lifestyle is built. And you can't do this. You need an intellectual to do this. You need to be, you know, study so much intellectual sciences to be able to construct an argument to fight against these. So these people have the advantage of the context. The context is in their favor because the context has f its faults. So they build on these faults and they don't have to establish them because they are already established. But for you to come with a counter argument, you have to demolish these principles, which is very difficult because a lot of these assumptions are subtle. They are called assumptions. They're subtle. You're unaware of them. We don't even know that they, are ex they, they exist, but they are actually there. So that's why uh, my advice to uh, brothers and sisters, don't get so much involved. Don't get so much involved. If you have not studied Islam well, if you are not so much educated in Islam, don't, be, don't put yourself in a vulnerable position. I'm not saying, I'm not worried so much about you being embarrassed. I mean, you can get over this, that's fine. But I'm, what I'm worried about is that you start having doubts about yourself. I remember six years here in this masjid, a brother came to me. He was born into a, Mus in a, into a Muslim family in a Muslim country, educated most of his life in a Muslim country, but he later on migrated here and he brought his family and he's an intellectual, he's a university professor. And he's, he reads a lot, even Islamic books. And he's very well informed in terms of Islam. And he's, he used to come to me and say, you know, my colleagues at work and I, we speak about this, we spoke about that, we spoke about this issue in history, this issue in Islam, this legislation and this hukuma. And uh, then one day he comes to me and says, I want to talk to you about something. And I said, yes. And we sit literally there at the back. And the masjid was almost empty. That was after Fajr. And he breaks down in tears. And I, I say, what? He says, I'm doubting. I'm doubting that Allah is even there. I don't know how to push these doubts away. And I said, you? Like you're having debates every day with these people. You? He says, yes, it's just like an obsession, obsessive thinking. That this, what if Allah is not there? And he says, I can't even get it out of my head. And he says, wallahi, I'm doubting my faith. And it's, it's, I'm losing sleep over that. So don't jeopardize your faith for the sake of you know, winning some, someone else or feeling good about yourself. Don't play Zach and Nike. Zach and Nike is not. Zach and Nike is someone who's constructed and uh, he, he's done, he has an architecture around his arguments. So he's worked on this so many years before he became visible, right? He has his own logic as well. Okay, so any speaker, by the way, any speaker, and this is something that's well, well known in public speaking, any speaker, what you see of them is about 20% of what they know. There's a lot of knowledge in the background that gives power to what they say, but they don't share it. That's normal. That's how we are, human beings. So when you hear an argument and you take the argument and you think, oh, I can say this, right? But you don't have the background knowledge of all of this to back it up. So you're in a very vulnerable position. So what I would say, don't put yourself there. Don't put yourself there. If you have an advice to someone, give it to them. But don't get involved so much. You know, doing groups and meetings and seminars and things like that. And you find yourself stuck in questioning your faith and your iman. If you want to do something for Islam, what is your specialty? It could be directly related to knowledge in Islam. Maybe there's something you can contribute. Go ahead. Your contribution could be something else. Could be in philanthropy. Could be in charity work. Could be in youth work. Could be in art. Could be in writing. It could be, you could be a blogger, I'm telling you, you could be a simple Muslim blogger who has this, their sins, their weaknesses, but they have some good aspects. You could be doing a good job. You still be, could be doing a good job. Some people say, oh, no, 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 these people are exposing their sins. Well, maybe, but their sins, they're going to be pun punished for that. Maybe they seek forgiveness. We don't know. But there are people who are actually showing a beautiful side of Islam, even though they have their own weaknesses and their own mistakes. So if there is something that you are good at and you are offering and you can offer that with the minimum amount of mistakes and more goodness and you can ask people who can guide you and show you, at least that's what you should do. But trying to play someone else, trying to be Ahmad Didad or Khalid Yasin, don't do this. 
These people have studied for so many years, 20 years, 30 years, a dedication, full dedication of study and passion, and they made it their goal. They made it their life mission to do this. So, so don't get out of your area in that sense. Don't expose yourself to such a great fitna where you're going to lose uh, your faith. SubhanAllah, so we're supposed to talk about Imam Ahmed, but I do think that these messages are very important. These Imams were not naive. So some of the arguments that they presented when it came to Aqeedah, they were not there at the time of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ did not need to talk about As-Sifat Al-Khabariyya wa As-Sifat Al-Dhatiyya wa As-Sifat Al-Fa'liyya The attributes of Allah. Some of them are related to action, some of them are related to Allah Himself, some of them are just based on evidence and things like that. Some of them are Aqliyya. There, there is a, logic and a logical understanding behind them. The companions didn't say this. Why? Because there was no need. The Quran and Sunnah are clear. But when people brought arguments that blemished the clarity of this aqeedah, these scholars had to come up with terminology to clear the confusion. To clear the, and this is at each time. This is how the Muslim scholars have been doing. But in our times, Muslims have not been doing well yet. Even when we try to give up, give something uh, new, something that's relevant, we come from a position of inferiority. Like the Al-Ijaz uh, Al-Ilmi fil Qur'an Al-Kareem. Scientific miracles in the Qur'an, right? It started as a good notion, everything. Then we started chasing science. Everything, even a theory, shows up in science. Whoa, that's in the Qur'an. We're so happy. Inferiority in its, at its best. We're chasing after what scientists say, whether, whether we check it's true or not. And we jump in there, we're saying, yeah, that's in the Qur'an, that's in the Qur'an, that's in the Qur'an. We're happy, we're cheering ourselves up. What happens 20 years later, this theory, there's a serious flow, flow with it. Where are Muslims? I remember when I first, I was really excited when I read this uh, argue, uh, or this. Uh, which the book is being distributed and still it has a good impact, but I mean, we need to be careful because that's backfiring now uh, about the embryology, right? The states of the embryo and how it's mentioned in the Quran in clear detail and so on and so forth. So one thing, I was very happy with this, so I go into uh, more detail trying to look at scientific journals and books and textbooks, what they say about this. And it turned out that it's not so well defined even in science. So for us to take one theory in terms of embryology or one way to look at it, one classification, to look at it and say, oh yeah, you see, that's in the Qur'an. But you have other classifications that disagree completely with this. And these are mainstream in science more than the one you chose. Then you present this as Islam and you are exposing people to fitna. You know why? Because if someone embraces Islam based on this kind of argument with good intention, later on when someone knocks this off for them, do you know what happens? The whole faith might crumble. It could be. What I'm saying is that if we are going to contribute something, we should come from a position of balance and power. That we are coming from the revelation of Allah. We're coming from the revelation of Allah. And it's pure and it's been preserved. And if someone has good knowledge of science, they can use whatever is been uh, whatever Islam has been attacked with from a scientific point of view and show the futility of this. But not try to prove Islam through science. That's a very low position to come from. Maybe in a personal argument you might want to bring some of those because the person is so much immersed in science and it's just, it's a key to open up their mind. I mean, you could do this, but for this to be a general approach, for this to be the focus of so many people and so many journals, so many books, and it's a whole movement, now it's backfiring. And I'm telling you, there's a, there's a number of Muslims in the Muslim world and even in the Arab world, there's a wave of atheism and agnosticism. There is a wave and it's scary and people, and like people, officials are really scared about this. And one of the main uh, like some, some people have been researching into this. One of the main reasons behind it is the path that Al-I'jaz Al-Ilmi, Scientific Miracles on the Quran, this kind of approach, has actually contributed to that greatly. We need to be careful. So our predecessors, these great scholars, like these four Imams, when they came up with something, it was authentic. 
it was based on Islam. But it was still relevant and very well informed of their time. And that's what you find with Imam Ahmad. Rahimahullah ta'ala. So the issue of Khalq al-Qur'an, some Muslims, some Muslim scholars fell to it because they were not up to date with the intellectual arguments that were present at the time. They said, that's philosophy, we don't want it. I mean, fine, you don't want it. So stay away completely from it, don't say anything. But these say, same scholars, they said, well, yeah, the Quran, they started thinking about it because they don't have even the tools to think about this philosophical argument. They said they made a statement and they fell into saying something haram, something that's kufr. But the Imams, the real well-versed Imams, they understand, they understood this. They understood what it means to say the Quran is the creation. Because they were well informed of what was going on. They were keeping up to date with what was happening. So they knew when those Mu'tazila came up with that statement, what it meant, where it was coming from. What are the intellectual conclusions of these statements? Because these would lead to faulty conclusions, serious conclusions about Allah and about the Quran. So, the, uh, so these Imams were, as I said, up to date and they were very well established in their sciences. So they were able to handle these situations. We Muslims are supposed to be able to handle that. We can't stay outdated. If we want to deal with them, if you don't want to deal with them and you want to be safe, that's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. But don't impose this on your children because your children are going to have a different set of challenges than you. You can lock yourself up. You can say, I don't want to have an online life even. I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't want to even a laptop or a smartphone. That's fine for you. You can survive if you're in your 40s, in your 50s. It's like 20, 30 years, you're going to stay here, you can do. You, know, you can get your children to do things for you. But your children, that's their, that's their daily life. Most of the work that we do is done online now. Most of the projects that we do are done online. Most of our communication is online. Most of life is happening online. So you have to equip them, at least so they ha you have to give them some kind of exposure to people who can educate them, who can teach them, who can help them out. If you don't find teachers, maybe you want to think of relocating instead of leaving your children vulnerable. And there is a shortage of people who are able to relate. And there are people who have their own business, it's just they're sitting there, they're putting their heads in the sand, they're reading uh, Muslim books that are authentic and that are true and that are good but they're limiting themselves to these books that were written a thousand years ago and they say that's what we have to deal with and these people live in denial to the immediate reality that we're dealing with and they want to force this on everyone anyone who does not take that kind of perspective anyone who says no there is an, a new reality that we have to deal with otherwise we'll be far behind and we will lose our younger generations and we'll use a lot of the people who are not so much practicing they're, they're not so much knowledge oriented but they are intellectuals they are educated they have this exposure they need some help from experts we can't let them down so we need to come up with arguments that are authentic but that are, that are relevant and then you have these people who are sitting who, whose heads are in the sand they're just shooting at these guys. Oh, that's wrong. Oh, you're selling, you're a sellout. Or you are, you're compromising on your religion. Or you're this and you're that. And they're just speaking from their ivory tower on things. Because if these people, you put them in a position where they are faced with any of these arguments, they are defenseless. They can't do anything. But obviously, they live in this kind of cage where they have caged themselves and... And they live in denial to reality and they can feel the king of that cage. And that's it. They live in their own small reality. And they want to force this on everyone else. The times that we're going through are not easy. Things are going to be challenging. So you're having intellectual arguments. You're having ethical arguments. You're having uh, social issues and pressures. You're having political issues. You're having... Uh, Theological, religious questions and challenges that if we are not able to deal with, we'll be swamped. We'll be overwhelmed. And our Imams never did this. They never said, okay, you know, uh, the companions, we have Hadith and we have Quran and we just recite Hadith and we teach Hadith and we recite Quran and that's it. No, they looked at these arguments. What are these people saying? They're saying the Quran is created. What does that mean? 
People understand this kind of philosophy. What does it mean? This is the statement. In intellectually, it means this. This is the conclusions, logical conclu conclusions of this. They test it out. They look at it. They study it. That's that's wrong. So what do we do? We fight it back. We write about it. We establish, you know, arguments, very well ar uh, built arguments around it that are authentic in order to repel the falsehood. And that's it. That's how the imams have always done. This is why the imams wrote books on aqidah. Why would you write a book on aqidah when the aqidah is in the Quran and the Sunnah? Why would uh, Ibn Taymiyyah write al-aqidah al-wasatiyya? Why would al-tahawi write al-aqidah al-tahawiyya? Why would, why would Imam uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab write Kitab al-Tawheed? It's in the Quran and the Sunnah. Why? In response to something new. In response to something new. There is, you have the Quran, you have the Sunnah, but when there is a new argument, it creates a new context. And that new context becomes misleading. People are unable to relate to the authentic sources. So what do you need to do? Create a counter context. Counter argument that is relevant, that is able to charge that current argument and push it away. So people will still have access to the original sources. That's it. That's it. But you want to use still a language that was used 400 years ago to be able to repel language that has been developed five years ago by devils devils <laughs> working 24 7 to get some kind of arguments and circulate them people have studied philosophy they've studied argumentation they've studied influence they've studied leadership they've studied politics they've studied policy they've studied history and these people are using all of this development in social sciences to manipulate the world and you can see what they're doing they're playing with the world with these viral videos with, with all of this kind of propaganda. They know what the, these guys, they know what they're doing. I mean, with naivety, you can't face them. Yes, we need to depend on Allah and put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah, the Prophet says, Aqil wa tawakkal. Do what you can do or what you are supposed to do. All you can do, do it, invest in it, and your heart rests with Allah. And that's what the scholars like have been explaining about, uh, about to, what tawakkul means. Tawakkul means doing everything in your action, in your actions, but your heart is with Allah. That's what tawakkul is. So, as, as we go, inshallah, then I'll leave the rest of Imam uh, Ahmed's story for next week. But what I want you to keep in the background of your, of your mind is we are studying these, we need to see the relevance. And that's ibra. Ibra in Arabic means ubur. Ubur is crossing a bridge. You're crossing a bridge from one side to the other. How? Their side is their life, their history, their times. But we have to cross that over to our times. To our times, where we can see the relevance. We can see the relevance. So we can learn these lessons. That's what Ibra in, in this verse means, and that's what it means in Arabic. Ibra. You can't, for example, you know sometimes when you watch a, a Bedouin movie or a Bedouin uh, series on TV, you want to go like a nomad. You don't want to drive a car. You just want to go on a camel or a horse. You just feel like it. You start even, you know, living a very simple kind of life. Why? Because you're caught up in that. You're caught up in that. You know, let your child watch a, a movie or a series on uh, soccer. You're going to find the child playing soccer with everything. They're going to kick everything in the house, right? Because they immersed in it. Uh, sometimes when we study the seerah of the Prophet or the history of our great personalities, we take it as an escape to keep away from our reality because we don't want to face it. That's not the right approach. We should travel into it, live it as a human experience, take the lessons and bring those lessons back and live in our times and deal with our times. We can't take the seerah of the Prophet as an escape. You can't. And that's the only way you can understand the Qur'an. A lot of us, you know, the Qur'an when it was revealed at the time of the Prophet ﷺ was so relevant. It talks about events that happened yesterday. And it talks about details. So it was very relevant to the companions. It was like, that's it. It's, it's all about our daily reality. But look at it now. When we read it, oh, it seems like we're talking about 1400 years ago. For 1400, uh, yeah, 1400 years ago. Why? Because we're unable to make this ibra, ubur, cross over. The Qur'an has the ability, and that's what the scholars have been doing. They've been trying to bridge this gap between us and the Qur'an. Because we're so stuck in our context. So we need to be able to travel and see and take the lessons, and talk the, take this, those lessons and bring them to our time, and apply them in a relevant way. That's the only way we can understand the Qur'an. Then you will find the Qur'an relevant. You'll find out the Qur'an speaks about things that are happening today. 
You can see the connections. Where most of us, the Quran is just a book, read it, memorize it, has nothing to do with what I, with my daily life. That's why. That's the way you don't benefit from the Quran. Ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to make it easy for us. I apologize for this kind of ranting, but I think these are issues we need to bring up and talk about every now and then, so we are aware of them. Barakallahu fiqum. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Nabi Muhammad wa alihi wasallam. Nabi Muhammad. So this is was not about Imam Ahmed. So we changed the title. We'll leave that one for next week, inshallah.